the things the organizers of the workshop and of the whole uh, in getting went the semester. Very nice to be here. So please uh, have a last look on Andre's open problem <laughs> because I need support. I need support later on. Just delete it. Something was already done. Yeah. You have a question. <laughs> You're delivering. The best way to solve a problem is to go away. <laughs> Actually, maybe it's, I'm doing just the same now. <laughs> but speaking of irrelevant questions, so um, I had some time in here and uh, thought, okay, that I could seek over a few things which are not so urgent here in my mind, but which might fit somehow in this work or I might have a uh, relaxed look on. So when Gregor and I started uh, working with constructive uh, convex analysis, one of the first things we came across uh, is the Minimax theorem. Uh, so we I will talk about this for a while now. So take a, take a uh, look. What it really says. It says, uh, first of all, can I define such uh, sets as n? Direct with an R of n with non negative, non -negative component which sum up to 1. It's a simplex. It's a unit simplex in R n. <coughs> and the proposition says, so this version of Minimax theory says it doesn't, it contains. Um, no min, no max, but the super min. It says the following. If you um, take, fits, uh, take a fixed matrix, then, then you can uh, calculate this real number in the sense of matrix multiplication. So I didn't write the transposition because I couldn't uh, decide whether I should consider vector is column or row by default. Just take it, take it such that the multiplication is defined. That means P should be a row and Q a column. So the theorem says that you can uh, switch the, the order of the name sub and inf here. It's a famous theorem by, uh, from Neumann, and it uh, plays a, an important role in game theory. Um, of course, originally it was. Uh, considered in the framework of classical mathematics. It therefore comes the name minimax theorem. So uh, classically we could say maximum instead of supremum and minimum instead of infimum here. We need to get the subtle point. So some P not Q not such 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 that P not and Q not is this uh, common value. Uh, how did we define that? Well, we're just looking what is going on in constructive economics game theory, and we naturally came on a funding thing for that. Is, uh, that this is treated, and in the paper it's also treated that we cannot expect to have this real max min version, neither can we expect to have the set of points. But this holds. These two things in the, uh, in the paper um, is proved. Okay. And I was reading the paper for uh, quite a long, many times, because it's somehow inspired in broadest to the path of complex analysis and finance dimensions. And uh, so now, after a couple of years, we have encountered some experience in, in finite dimensional. Convex things, and, and, and uh, I wanted to rethink about it in a sense. Now I'm, now I thought, at least now I must really understand it. And uh, I wanted to find just for myself uh, a fairly short proof. And uh, <coughs> uh, then I found some way 
to make the unity and found some way of proving it. But uh, recently on Sunday, as I suddenly found, it's, uh, I might, uh, I was tempted to state the following, the following, uh, uh, the following implication. What's the for a matrix, what about the matrix, in order to have such P's and Q's, which says if for all P there is a Q, if take positive, and with a universal Q, that's such that this holds for all P. What about that? Well, I found it uh, in a sense difficult, but it's uh, just from a technical point of view, even if you couldn't read the formula, it looks somehow nice. Because it's all, all, almost the same, just a little switched here, switched the quantifiers. And it reminded me of uh, some of my favorite axioms, which are fancy element to this lemma, the switching, switching the axiom can be somehow mean or interesting or can be something, can, can mean something to you. So, what about that, I thought? And I want to discuss this. Uh, of course, the spoiler, I also let you see so it might be probable. But uh, leave it open for a moment. What about that? So it's nice, it's beautiful. Second, I, it uh, immediately implies minimax. It's also something nice. Can you see that? Uh, let's try, yeah? So first, uh, one of the inequalities is, is easy, and the other one is not so easy. Uh, this is the easy one, but maybe the let's have a look. So, fix, first fix a P prime in a Q, and uh, then this holds this inequality, because here we have P prime a Q, and here we have, we have the same, but going to the supremum of these two P's. The minimum is something to infinity, so it's bigger. Then those expressions, uh, depending on q, if, if so it's a function, then uh, if they are point by smaller equal, then take it to infinity modulus. In here it's this model we fill up. And finally, go to the supremum with the p primes. Then you have uh, this inequality. It's just now it's p prime, but it doesn't make any sense. Again. So this is easy, isn't it? Um, but the other, the other way is the other way down is not so easy. But um, I hope it follows easily from that uh, conjecture. Can you see that? Uh, we want to prove uh, this one, the other, the other direction. So let's suppose that it's really smaller here. So being greater equal is the same as not being smaller. So assume smaller and find a contradiction. If it's smaller, then there's some interval in between. And uh, moving a little uh, moving a little around, you can assume that that interval squeezed with, uh, between is contains a zero. So that this is even negative in the body and the other one is even positive for some positive yota. Okay, let's uh, have that assumption. And we need a contradiction. But uh, let's check that one implies this formula. Does it? The one will not get confused with the P's and Q's. Here it says the supremum. is below minus yota. So for a fixed Q, for a fixed P, this infimum is below minus yota. So there must be, for some Q, it must uh, be close to minus yota. That means still negative. Okay? Um, but this is just a premise of, of our secret proposition or conjecture. So it implies that we have such a universal Q. And this should contradict two. 
equals two says so the integral is below iota. So at least for each q, it is below iota. So for each q, some p should, ca should carry it as a positive. But uh, it, it couldn't for, for, for this p. So it seems that uh, our axiom finds um, a very nice meaning. Good. But it alone is not, is not so, so that we can force it here as a formula, it wouldn't need to put any plus a minimum. So it, uh, it must be provable, then it will be quite interesting. Our problem should be provable. And that's what we, I want to do here to prove it. Which I think it's the same as most things. But carefully, we just restrict the possibility. I want to know that this is. Switch on the light. So first, um, what does it mean if it exists? I made, I made a mistake. I made a mistake. Did somebody know this? It is, it's, it says, it says great to here. And I, I, I use smaller bit. So it's, well, but it doesn't get there, I think. Because it's just with the other matrix. So it, uh, we use it for minus now. I mean, it's more natural to formulate it with plus, with plus. Just, it just uh, uh, comes to my mind. So, what does it mean existing a Q such such the complex combination is in, is in the positive? It means the following. <coughs> it just means that, that uh, X is a negative, a positive component. To left, if x is a positive component, let's say the first component is positive, then take uh, for q take the first integer. Good. Other, in, other way around, if either you, you think of it uh, geometrically, you say uh, this color product is a convex combination of the components of x. And if uh, this is positive, then at least one must be positive. But you could, you could also say, analytically, if this is positive, then one, it's a sum, a finite sum, then one of the terms must be positive, because uh, generally, sum positive implies one is positive. And uh, if so, we have such a product is positive, but uh, we also have generally if a product is positive and one of the terms is non negative, then the other one must be positive. So, with, in applying those rules here lead us to, to some positive component of, <coughs> of X. Okay? 
It's very trivial, of course, I admit, but uh, it's good because we get uh, rid of the queue, in a sense. We get rid of a quantifier. Of course, it's a little bit cheating, but it still makes the other quantifier over the eye. But it's a little more harmless because it's finite. Yeah? Well, you really construct it with a finite eye, and you can hide it something with a non principle, and then you will be able to do it. In which step here? Yes. You mean this rule? Okay, so yeah. No, no, let's let's uh, let's look at it. So the sum is greater equal than let's say three. Then compare both terms with zero and one. So each of them. So if the lambda is positive or smaller than one, or mu is positive. Okay, no, sorry, yeah, no, because you have actually positive, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 No, but that's very, as, 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 uh, I think that's uh, good. Because it means to figure that somewhere. Mm -hmm. So, because we've said, we mark, uh, look at the premise of the thing we want to prove. Was that is positive now? So now we can we get uh, so fix p and, and and this is a vector. So there is some q such that the scalar product is positive, then we have a positive component. Now we do the following. We define a set as uh, the convex hull of uh, finitely many vectors. But still, there's something with convex. <coughs> I mean, even the definition of the SN is already quite convex. Thing. So, uh, convex hull of n plus n vectors. A is a n n matrix. It is n rows. It takes those n rows. And they take uh, the n unit vectors in our n. I mean, we, we will prove something about the elements of y now, so then we will see what, what I mean with convex hull, which isn't clear. When I will take such an element, then, then we know what, what the element of the convex hull means. Because, so you can imagine that this was here is the matrix, and here is the unit matrix, and just take all of those rows and consider convex combinations. So what can we say? <coughs> we can say that each element of y is positive norm. So this was step one, step one. Now step two. So take such a y. Y can be written as. So first take a linear combination of the rows of A. That means that means that takes n coefficients. Lambda one, lambda n, A. 
And then take a linear combination of the rows of the unit matrix, which is just the coefficient vector. Okay, this is a let's say generic element of y, and uh, this should be a positive norm. This y, this small y, why? Because it is a, a positive component. Just have to be a little careful now. This PA, the P must be an uh, element of SN. And we don't know about the lambdas here. But by the way, what about the lambdas? The lambdas should uh, sum up to one of the non negative. But you don't know where they are weighted, where the weight is around. So if you say are here, if they are very small here, we, we can't distinguish from zero, we cannot imply that one. So make a case distinction. If the first n vectors are positive, then it's fine. Then we have morally we have beyond the simplex, we uh, can just multiply it so that we are in S M, and this is just uh, here. This P A is just in and out. This is a positive component then, and those are here we are not negative anyway. Then we have our positive component. Second case, this is very small. Then uh, Y is uh, dominated. By the second part, and if the first n elements are very small, the sum up to one and those must be quite big, so we, we get a positive component because of PA. Okay. So that's the very same construction was in your in your paper also. Something like that. The naturally, so such things appear naturally. Uh, then we lose separation, so we write something. Uh, spoiler, now comes something with separation. We are all here, we are here. Three. <coughs> Distance zero capital Y is positive. Crucial point. So each small each small y is positive known, so the distance must be positive. I know uh, it's, uh, it's true but it's not true at all. Because uh, the convex hulls, what, what do we know about convex hulls? Um, they're convex. Um, they're not rebounded. Located, but they are not closed. That's good. We don't. If we don't know how those, be, how the, we don't know how the rows of A behave, or they are different or not. So it destroys closedness. Uh, so we cannot uh, just assume it, but. We do something similar. I use this proposition P. It's just this of me. Okay? Because you now you have to delete proposition 3. Pro proposition 3 is a special case of uh, elements of our core. Um, 
this side, more a little bit clearer, which says, um, we normally, if we have a positive by function, if the incoming is positive, it's not very this feeling uh, defensive in a way. But if the function is convex or has some convexity property, then we don't need the same here. And the norm of the function is very, very great, it's convex. So we can apply that to position 3. And we are here. Sorry, I have a good question. So, is the y are. So, what, what is the uh, confusion? Where is it located? So, I suppose that in, in the convex cell, it could imagine a zero is an element of n. So, where are the elements? Where are the many elements of Rn? So, so yeah. that are they in the in the, uh, and then the picture? Oh, sorry. No, no, that's good. Okay. Yeah, so it's so there is a positive. So they are they are all positive, yes? Yeah? <coughs> yeah, okay. So they are they are three so it's R plus or I mean, um, This is a typical example. Yeah, yeah but so it's R plus and, 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 and they are on the positive side. Yeah? Can you remember all sorry. R plus Yeah, yeah. No, that's okay. I mean it's here it's um, Yes, here. So uh, this is what I had in mind, but just the point is positive. They are all positive. Yes? The elements, the main the elements. The elements are positive and negative in Rn. Yes, Each line is positive norm. So D0, right? The positive norm is. Uh, okay. okay. And now that it's stick to that, if you, if you take R and minus 1, yeah, you can minus mean, 1. Take like x and minus x, 0 will be on yeah. it. So, so yeah, but uh, uh, in that case, it might well be. In that case, we don't use the premise because uh, the then zero is in the convex combination. So yeah. then, uh, then it doesn't have positive norm. A positive norm means that it's on this side, sorry. Uh, I thought no, 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 let's, let's stick to that. It's a more detailed version of. Uh, ah, sorry, I'm stupid. I'm stupid. No, no, I thought you. you okay, so, so you're, it's Y in Y, which has positive norm, sorry. No, 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 no. So it's a more. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. It's not the generic version of the norm. But uh, now we have this. Look at the lemma. <coughs> the lemma is not. It's a. It's a. a, a Easy version of the situation theorem. We have a convex subset with even non solubile spaces. We have a, a convex subset. Zero is uh, bounded away from the subset. Uh, then we have a high separating hyperplane. Let's say. This was mentioned also today by the Hashim. Such a classic versions of uh, separation. This is very easy. This why it's a classic it's a proof. It's a, it's not it's a almost trivial. But it's you don't see it that often. Maybe it's too easy. It's very useful. We use it every day. Yeah. So where are we now? We have uh, yeah we have, we have we have three and we have set lemma. So we we separate y and zero by a hyperplane. Cool. 
by gamma is q such for all y. Right views position. It's a lemma, isn't it? Yeah, it's a lemma. Remember, the Q is in the low shell of Y, but we don't need it. We just need the Q itself. But this is now very strong because Y is quite thick. It contains the laws of, uh, of the original matrix and all the real vectors. So it contains all of everything on the same. And uh, Q is positive parabola with all those small y's. In particular, y contains unique vectors, so uh, the components of Q are positive. Then we can assume that Q is in this thing. So those co positive components, this here. Doesn't require data, I know, no, no specific bound. We just manipulate Q a little bit so that if the components sign up to one, so we, have, we can assume Q is in SM. And the rows of the matrix are in Y. And we got this. So, AQ, what's AQ? AQ is a vector consisting of scalar product with the rows and Q. The rows are here, such as they are positive. So, this has only positive components. So, if we have only positive components, and for each P, PEC is positive. I mean, what should P do? Uh, should that P, such that this doesn't fall, it's hard, because this is a PEC positive components, and those are with uh, positive components. No chance. But uh, so we get found that uh, Q that for all P part is positive. And if you are lucky, then you get also what you wanted. No? This is Q for all P part positive. Good. So it seems I didn't find a mistake with this now. It seems to work. Okay. Uh, what to do with that proposition? We don't know. It's too young and it's not so. It, may, it cannot be. It, it cannot be terribly uninteresting because it applies uh, minimax, and if it does incur, it's, it's not good. It's not trivial to have such minimax here because what is in one or the other way you need some projection and some plane and some separating symbols or no no way around that. So maybe we find some other application to that proposition makes things look good. Uh, it was it was uh, mainly what I wanted to say, but I can carry on a little bit. Yes. What was the crucial thing? The crucial thing was ah, it's here. The crucial thing was proposition three. Why does that hold? So, uh, in the spirit of uh, Professor Nance's uh, lecture, uh, I think we should ask ourselves what is the philosophical reason why uh, why this proposition holds? Proposition three. And uh, the answer is, let's, let's check if I can find the answer. That, uh, that the reason is that Collier's trees behave nicely. 
No, no wonder it's something you've committed to. Mm. It's, uh, it's a little bit like convict sticks and just seem to smother with convict sticks. Mm. Yeah. Anybody know about convict sticks? You've seen? But I uh, thought, thought uh, now we are relieved to get six vertebrates or three legs and suppose we have three half section. Set of finite binary sequences, this is a generic element, so it's not a zero, it's a indexing. This is a complete element. There are infinite binary sequences as well. The finite ones have a range, naturally. You can concatenate them. And those finite ones and infinite ones you can restrict <coughs> to the initial part. Here comes the first, it's a non-standard notion, saying it's a relation uh, on finite finite sequences. U is smaller than V, you say it's the same length. But they uh, they're not the same, and with the first stage where they differ, diverge, you three must have zero and you three and one. That's a quite natural relation. So then we have the, the usual double, double KL notions. <coughs> we have a desirability as a property of a subset of zero one prime, just the same range is desirable. We have closed under restriction. <coughs> Three means desirable and closed under restriction mm -hmm. and now convex. Convex means uh, I have three elements here in, in that relation, but in particular all of them are the same length. The outer ones are in T, then the ones in middle must also be in T. Convex tree. That's the convex tree. So here something is in T and everything in the T. So the levels are integrals in a sense. How about convex trees? It came up uh, in that reasoning indirectly. Uh, because there was some fan theory, some version of the fan theory that came across. Uh, such that the bar is uh, not convex, but the complement of the bar is convex. So that came up. But in a different context, uh, with Michael uh, Konachny and uh, Kihara, we uh, investigated uh, the constructive content constructive content of the intermediate by theorem. And we found that uh, it's just equivalent to weak Koenig's lemma for convex trees. So it, uh, from both sides it approached in a sense, the notion of convex trees, same time almost. Uh, Takako already introduced here, not just mentioned here zero. It's, uh, it was nice that fresh, it's a uh, constructive counterpart of possible zero. You need a formal framework for such a consideration because informally, or if you can collapse it in the, you need to assume some choice and weak Koenig lemma is just an ATO. But also the weak Koenig lemma for convex trees is an ATO, so it doesn't make much sense here. But with uh, the T and zero, we can distinguish uh, in sense how much choice we need. And then uh, uh, we found this uh, role of infinite convex trees. But uh, mainly I was, uh, I was uh, now speaking of this convex things, I was uh, interested in the other, the other side where it came from. Here, a lemma 2, which says every infinite convex tree with at most one pass has a pass. I know, I remember. 
you must say what is the most one pass. Okay, what is a pass? Clear? What is it? <coughs> and if most one pass is understood the following way, we have two uh, infinite sequences, they differ explicitly, they are apart, then ex what? also explicitly one is not in between. So every infinite convex tree with at most one pass is a pass. Um, that's related to proposition two, <coughs> the uniform minimum. We'll talk about it later. But uh, that's the first time in my life I'm speaking publicly about Austria. I shouldn't, I shouldn't, but why not? I'm very <coughs> Relaxed in a sense. <laughs> so in OCA, OCA not every infinite convex tree is a force. It's a corollary of that consideration. But please uh, check if it's permitted. My way of reasoning. Of course, it's somehow dirty. Just look at that. Later, uh, we have a look at the proof of the mod two, and we verify, verify that we don't need much choice. Uh, and therefore, it uh, could be also done in Austria as well. But uh, when it's say, I say it before every month, uh, at least it's, it's possible in EN0, in EN0. So it's also possible in Austria not. But sure, the loose reasoning is behind. So let's assume that this is fine in Austria not. But then, in the sense, it follows, doesn't it? Because assume that dot not t is a pause. In the classical regular analysis, we have such a negative elimination, don't we? So, not not, there is an infinite pause. So, assume there is no pause in search and we look for contradiction. Yeah? If we have no infinite pause, then we have at most one. No, there, there's, there, there's, there's no, there's, there cannot be two, in the sense. So, uh, 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 in case of pause, contradiction. So you could, I think it's okay. So why is that then? If we infinite one is two, the first one pass is a pass. This is a, uh, it can be seen as follows. So we just uh, so we're constructing a pause, and we 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 are deciding the first step, and we say uh, either the so Ellis statement less than n such that starting with one we are blocked uh, with uh, with the stage n, but on the other hand we are not blocked. That we are not blocked. And the same on the other way around. So it says you must go left. And say you must go left, and also you must go right. Otherwise, you are lost in the way. And uh, we can decide L and R. We can only prove that one of them holds, but not both. So we define the first step depending on L and R. That's a quite really, that's what I meant with predict choice. It's really innocent, isn't it? We could say it's a sigma C one choice because of the substantial quantifier idea. We could call it unique choice. I think uh, classical reverse mathematics say would say sigma zero zero conservation. Oh, yeah. Well, something at, uh, at mu to the R to the zero. Okay. So remains, what remains is to convince ourselves. Of course, you are not. Um, what is clear? This is clear. Not both things can hold because it's an infinite tree. It can, it cannot be that both uh, sides are blocked. And yeah, I know that. What do we need? We need a decision. We need a decision which which case we are. 
how do we get that? We cannot find that density. The, the, the nature of Kunig Lemma reasoning, the standard, uh, what you know, the and can look a little bit, depending on your eyesight, but you cannot look with no omissions. How can we find the information here? We can, we can find it as follows. Take uh, the two middle passes. So in the middle, but we have the most one pass, so one of them pass out. But we have an piso, we can say the height 100, it passes out. But still it's infinite, so if one of the little little right there is something inside, we have convexity. So the whole side must pass out. That's the principle. And here's the third step, then we need to see. It's very much related to uh, the same. Say that it's the straight here in here. It's just uh, the pen, the pen like uh, version of it. Decidable bar such that the complement is convex is a uniform bar. So that is a principle, a proof. Good. That was just, and then now as I haven't convinced you that how this is linked to the positivity. But just because those with something with convex, it's not that you want to reason, but yeah, it's not enough. But it's a strong link in the following proposition of one of our papers. So yeah, there's a famous Julian Lichten characterization of the pens here yeah, for decidable bars in terms of positivity of uh, function of unit interval. It's just the same as it's written here, just without the convex part. So for a moment, forget C. So this is a Julian Richman paper. And uh, we tried to include convexity here, and we succeeded, but it was very hard. And so we get in the sense, what would be very nice, the convexity notion would be here if it's just convex and P is the complement of P is convex, that would be nice. But we, it wasn't possible, we couldn't manage, so we had to, to weaken. Then we were weakening one condition, so that's why one, one application worked, but the other didn't work. We were weakening the other two. And so after a while, it was an equilibrium of conditions, which is here now co-convex and weakly convex. Uh, weakly convex. So co-convex is almost the complement is convex. Uh, what is weakly convexity of functions? Something very weak. It says if for any t f of t is positive, then one of the halves is uniform in one domain. And so then, so that's, uh, yeah, that's the convexity, it's weaker than convexity. Of course. Now, after all, this is, <coughs> this is convexity. And if you are here with your positive heavy, you cannot be small on both sides. And that was really, I, I'm wondering how many people will read that paper. It's really hard. I mean, it's difficult. It's difficult. It's really <coughs> easy for me. Okay. I think it's a good time to stop. So this is just a few, uh, we have written a few papers. If you're interested, you can read the papers. OK.
可以去给。I was slightly suspicious of, which means I didn't understand. Which um, one? The, well, it was the go to your proposition three slide, the, the very last one on the bottom. Oh, that one. Yeah, but it doesn't matter. It only seems to me. Yeah, well, but what, what, how do you claim? <laughs> how do you justify that claim on the bottom? Where is it? No, yeah. the right back. Oh, three. Right, oh, three. Oh, three. Yeah. oh, really? Three. Yeah. Sorry. This one? No, 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 proposition three. Really? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, yes, sir. <laughs> it's all the way. It's all the way. Right, okay, at the bottom, okay, this line is lemma one, yeah. Your sequence where the distance goes to the distance from zero to y, but how, how do you know the limit is there? Uh, because of. Um, it's, it's a good question, yeah? Because it's pushy. <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, I agree with that. But I think you're asking the uniform context of the Indian space. That's it. Okay, that's yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Of, because of this one, so it's a negative statement. Yeah. That also, we can always, I was hoping actually, I, I, 
Uh, I was hoping to, to give uh, another proof which, which uh, excessively exploits it, that uh, equality has no content, computationally, but they didn't. But uh, you're right, you're right. The, the, the nature of that is uh, of a kind that doesn't pollute me quite as easily over. That's true. Because the classical reasoning in the reality of our world is part of the scheme, but it's part of the discrete reality. It's still not part. They are numbers, you say. When you have the results for discrete reality scheme, they can apply the identity to the numbers. I would like to have some more information on the step where you use the unique types. The three? Yes. The three things? Okay. Which form of. It's a kind of dependent choice, I admit, yes. Dependent type. Yes. Because you are putting a pause. You have to, to say, I believe a way to go on. Yeah, there's this new construct, the third step. You make it, then you need to do it again. Uh, but uh, the stepwise decisions are very low, in this low level. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, so you go from a step, step first, you start the first part, right? And you <coughs> this point, you go away from the previous step. So that could be two better. Everybody is walking around the slides, proposition two. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best one, isn't it? <laughs> I hope it doesn't um, collect. So this kind of universal of quantifiers is characteristic of quantifying universally on a compact space and existentially on a reverse one, provided that the open set, uh, the, the predicate in question is monotone in the physical sense. And so one way to test whether this is of the same kind would be to uh, get rid of the compactness of, of the existential quantifier. So the question to ask here would be, does this still remain, does this influence still hold if you make Sn an open syntax, the interior of syntax? Because then it would be just reverse but not compact. And that should suffice. You should never use compactness of Sn because it's unnecessarily quantified. Uh, did you use it? It would be very surprising if you did. No, I don't think we did it. Uh, but we said no, not at all. Ah, uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, what did you mean? Careful. So one of them is always going to be open, but the other one will have to have to remain closed. Uh -huh. The one that is being universally quantified, that one should be compact. So keep it closed. But the uh, the one that is essentially quantified should be open, and then it should still be possible. Okay, good. So, this is something that synthetic topology would tell you to try. So, there are many, many ways to generate <laughs> that uh, and take a look at it. Open up one of the sets. Okay, is there any other comments so far? No, let's translate it again. <laughs>